When you think of WWE stars who've been forced into retirement due to injury, you immediately think of the likes of Daniel Bryan, Edge, and Paige. A lot of people seem to forget that Tyson Kidd, a former three-time WWE Tag Champion, was also forced into an early retirement in 2015 after suffering what was almost a fatal injury after taking a wayward muscle buster from Samoa Joe in a Raw Dark match. Kidd suffered a spinal cord injury for which he underwent surgery and currently has 16 staples, four screws, and a metal rod in his neck. His recovery has been hailed as miraculous, as most people would have been left completely paralyzed by the injury. So much like Daniel Bryan and Edge, he'll never return to the ring. Hey, wait a second. Rumors of a potential Tyson Kidd return have been fueled after a video of Tyson running the ropes and doing a headstand on the ropes was posted on Natalia's Instagram. This is easily the biggest hint we've seen that Kidd's in-ring career might not be over just yet, which would be a gift to fans considering Kidd was way ahead of his time during his wrestling prime as a wrestling technician. But things aren't quite so rosy on the AEW side of things. When AEW was first created, one of the biggest questions fans wanted answered was where they would be able to watch the show. Well, if history has taught us anything, it's that we should have known it would be on TNT, where all good WWE rivals like to wrestle. One of the people who was instrumental in getting AEW the TNT TV deal was Kevin Riley, who has just been sacked from his role of content chief at Warner Media and as the president of TNT, TBS, and True TV in a massive company-wide restructuring. While this may not affect AEW, the consequences could be huge. It will have been incredibly important for Cody and Co to have a major supporter so high up in Warner Media, and now that he's gone, future TV deals may be much harder to secure. If you're still not convinced that this is big news, just look at this tweet from Dave Meltzer. This news is gigantic. Can't express how big. Riley was the one who greenlit AEW. Riley was the guy who was a large part of why there is an AEW. See? Gigantic. Speaking of gigantic, by far the most talked about segment on this week's Raw was of course the gigantic debut of Raw Underground. The shoot Fight Club style matches hosted by your uncool dad, Shane McMahon. It's fair to say the response to this has been mixed, with some fans hating it and others thinking it's the greatest idea ever. One of its main supporters, and it's always useful to have this guy supporting you, is Vince McMahon. According to the Wrestling Observer newsletter, the only two segments that Vince McMahon had greenlit before the day Raw was taped was the Randy Orton segment and Raw Underground, which could suggest that Vince is actually thinking of keeping the concept alive for more than three weeks. Fine. Just get rid of the dancing ladies, please. Shane McMahon, more than three week push confirmed. Maybe. And now it's time for a review of last night's episode of SmackDown in about five minutes. Thank you for being awesome, Pledgehammers on Patreon. Will always mark out for Ollie Landrum and Luke's favorite fan, the one, the only, the awesome Bubba. After a recap of the Swamp Fight and the Fiend's awesome attack on Alexa Bliss last week, we cut straight into a Firefly Funhouse, where Bray Wyatt has replaced all the pictures in the Funhouse with pictures of Braun Strowman. He blames Braun for the Fiend attack on Bliss, saying he should have saved her, and if he doesn't save her this week, he'll see what he's really capable of. That sounds pretty ominous. But enough of that, are you ready for a good time? Because the main show kicked off with Matt Riddle versus Sheamus, which was very good, with both feeling each other out early before getting into some very physical offense later on. But the finish was somewhat inevitable after Shorty G's heel turn last week, as he came out and attacked Riddle on the outside, causing the DQ finish. But just to make sure that Gable doesn't accidentally get over in any way, he got beaten to hell and back by Riddle, who left him laying, and then Sheamus bro kicked him twice for causing the DQ you win for Riddle. Way to make him look entirely useless. Fingers crossed this leads to Gable getting so beat down he sheds his shorty G nonsense and refocuses his efforts on being an actual wrestler. Sheamus continued to be angry backstage, getting all up in Corbin's business, complaining about shorty G costing him the match, which I was weirdly into. I like characters that make sense, and it makes perfect sense that Sheamus would be pissed off about his match ending in DQ loss. Unfortunately though, what came next was pretty terrible. The dirt sheet with Miz and John Morrison has has always been inconsistent on the funny scale, and this edition definitely slid down the scale to the really, really not funny end. Miz and Morrison interviewed Mandy Rose's hair, each providing voices for her hair. <laughs> Why, yes, it was terrible. But then they introduced Sonya Deville, and suddenly I was much more interested. Sonya cut another typically brilliant Sonya promo about Mandy and her image being all she has before Heavy Machinery came out to end the segment. And Otis remembered his briefcase this time. Otis was very angry 
angry backstage as well, and it was weirdly refreshing to see him being serious, saying that once he was finished with Miz and Morrison, no one would be laughing. I like serious Otis. Give me more of it. After this was Cesaro versus Lince Dorado, which was a really fun match, and Lince even got a promo before the match. It looked like Lince was about to get the shock roll-up victory, but Cesaro managed to kick out, hit a brutal uppercut into the neutralizer for the win. Looks like we're building to LHP versus Cesaro and Nakamura at SummerSlam, and I am perfectly okay with that. Something I'm not perfectly okay with, though, was the Fiends segment next. I have missed The Fiend's entrance, and it is always an amazing thing to watch, and it's only slightly ruined by Michael Cole saying completely inane things like, The Presence of The Fiend. Thanks Cole, that really helped me understand who The Fiend is. Weirdly though, The Fiend came out by himself, it cut to an ad break, and when it came back, suddenly Alexa Bliss was sitting in the ring with him. Did I, did I miss something? Where did she come from? No time to dwell on that though, as it looks like The Fiend is winding up for another attack on Bliss before she stops his arm and caresses his face. The Fiend looks frustrated and stands up before half of Braun's face appears on the Titan Tron. At this point, I don't even care the Universal Champion is there. What's going on with The Fiend and Bliss? Braun cut a spooky promo about him being the most evil son of a bitch now. And that must be true because he then said he didn't give a damn about Alexa. Nice, Braun. He said The Fiend can challenge him at SummerSlam. And for me, Braun is the least interesting part of this feud. The segment just ends though, so I guess that's that then. Alexa's all good, I assume? After that was Jeff Hardy versus King Corbin, which was definitely a match, before it ended in DQ in a nice mirror of earlier in the night, with Sheamus bro-kicking Jeff Hardy into the ring apron, which looked great. After an ad break, this led into Sheamus versus King Corbin, which, after early in the night, I wasn't really into. Heel versus heel matches are always much more tricky to pull off, and this didn't really work. I personally was cheering for Sheamus, but that's because I like Sheamus. There's no way I should be cheering for the guy who literally tried to make a guy fall into addiction again. Again. After a quick match, Matt Riddle provides a distraction for Sheamus to hit a bro kick on Corbin for the win. I'll give WWE credit, I like these intertwining stories between Corbin, Sheamus, Hardy, Riddle and Gable, and I hope it leads to something like a like a fatal five-way number one contenders match for the Intercontinental title, or something like that, at SummerSlam. I dig it, I think it'd be cool. Bailey and Banks are backstage next, continuing to sow those seeds of dissension, before they're called to the ring for a video conference with the almighty Stephanie McMahon. She says Sasha will be defending her Women's Championship at SummerSlam, and Bailey will as well, having her number one contender decided next week in a triple brand battle royale. Once again, Stephanie appears on our screens and talks down to the stars of the show, and leaves with her head held high. Miz and Morrison vs Heavy Machinery was the main event of this show. Wait, Sonya, why are you with Miz and Morrison now? Get away from them, you're better than this, Sonya. And I tell you what guys, I've missed Tucker. Seeing him wrestle again gave me the warm fuzzies. But of course he got worked over leading into an Otis hot tag, where he ran wild and connected with the caterpillar before Miz broke up the pin. They continued to brawl to the outside, where a shorter-haired Mandy Rose showed up to attack Sonya Deville. They fought into the ring, and despite no one from the actual match being involved, or even in the ring at the time, this caused the DQ. I hate WWE sometimes. After an ad break, there is precisely one producer trying to break up Mandy and Sonya backstage before the lights cut out. Oh no. And no, it's not The Fiend. It's the group that had been overtly teased throughout the night, not just from the tent issues and lights flickering, but by the commentary team going, hick, 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 the lights are going out, what do you think? Is it the retribution we saw on Monday? Shut up, Corey. Shut up, Cole. And yes, after they threw a Molotov cocktail at a random generator on Monday, a ton of people showed up here in hoods and masks with crowbars and baseball bats. The group came to the ring, started attacking people at ringside, including camera people, before heading behind the plexiglass and attacking some NXT talent, spray painting some random things on plexiglass, the steps, aprons, and the the ring itself. There was a guy with a chainsaw who then cut the ring ropes one at a time for extra effect. And then the show went off the air. Now look, I've seen loads of people being unhappy with this angle online, and I gotta say, I don't get the hate. Maybe it's just me being happy that this feels like something different in the increasingly stale and samey WWE product, but I'll always pop for a big old group of people coming out and messing up the set. And yes, this wasn't the Nexus, I get that. But the main complaint I've seen from people online is that the people were short. What has that got to do with anything? The people had baseball bats and actual weapons, not even like WWE weapons like kendo sticks and chairs, and they wrecked everyone's shit. Height? 
has nothing to do with it. I'm into it. I'm not completely jaw-droppingly amazed by them like I was with the Nexus debut, but it's something new and different. At least give them a chance instead of saying, lol, they're short, must be bad. That's Vince McMahon levels of thinking right there. I'm going to let it play out a little bit first before I just write them off. Also, it's worth pointing out that the people that did this assault are almost certainly not the people who are going to be revealed as part of the group, especially if Dominic Dijakovic is one of them from his Twitter teases. He's a big lad. So that was this week's show. Overall, I thought this was fine. You could tell they went through last minute rewrites and were struggling to fill for time with two Sheamus and King Corbin matches, but what they did was okay. The Fiend thing was a bit weird, as was the dirt sheet, but most everything else on the show was at least good and don't at me guys, I liked the retribution angle. This show gets a smack bang in the middle, three out of five. Check out our new actually good series on Parts Fun Known, where in the first installment, Luke Owen takes a look at whether Charlotte Flair is actually good. It's honestly really great. Press the video to the right to be taken over there, and press the video below that to find out more about Vince McMahon giving up on a Raw star. Again, I've been Chopper Pete Quinnell, and that was wrestling.